We're going to continue now talking about the um, ear and how it is used for our, our uh, ability to detect equilibrium and also hearing. So let's start with the external anatomy of the ear. So we have two ears and external anatomy we have was there's three parts to each ear there's external middle and inner so external is basically what you see this big flap is called the auricle and inside it you're gonna have what's called the ear canal or external auditory canal and that's gonna continue all the way until your eardrum uh, begins and the eardrum is called the tympanic mem membrane. So tympanic membrane is the eardrum. That's the termination of the external ear. The other thing that we have going on in the ear canal is, if you remember, we have these ceruminous glands which secrete cerumen or earwax. The middle ear is uh, where we have the auditory ossicles. So if we look at the middle ear, it's in this area here. So it's this cavity. And the big, big thing about it, you have these bones in here. These are called auditory ossicles, and these are the bones that are used in hearing. So there's three in each ear. We have the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. So malleus is supposed to look like a hammer almost, so a mallet. Um, the incus is the middle one, and the stapes is supposed to look like a stirrup. If you look at it closely, you can see how you might be able to fit your foot in there. So... Uh, those are your three auditory ossicles. The malleus attaches to the tympanic membrane. The stapes on the other end fits into an opening called the oval window, oval window which we'll come back to. Uh, the other thing about the middle ear, you have this thing called the eustachian tube, which goes from the middle ear down to the pharynx, and basically your throat. And so uh, this helps alleviate some pressure differences between the internal and outside of the body. Uh, so if you think about like if you're in an airplane, your ears might start popping. And so to alleviate that, you can just open your mouth and it allows the pressures to equilibrate relatively quickly. All right, and then we have the inner ear. And this is where we have a lot going on. So the inner ear consists of this structure. So this is generally called bony labyrinth. And inside it, you're going to have membranous labyrinth. So it looks like a big kind of like maze. So you get this area right here called the cochlea. It looks like a snail. That's what We're going to use that in hearing. You have these big rounded arches looking things. These are called semicircular canals. These are used in equilibrium. And then you have this area in between called the vestibule, which is also used in equilibrium. So as far as bony versus membranous labyrinth, this is a good picture that kind of shows the difference. So uh, it may be easier to start with the membranous labyrinth. So if you look all through these structures, so the cochlea semicircular canals, you have this pink, pinkish membrane in there. So that's the membranous labyrinth, everything within that little membrane. Everything outside of that would be the bony labyrinth because it's surrounded by bone. So if we took a quick cross section, this is a good place to do it because we're going to see this later. Um, if we took a cut right here and looked at it, you see how we have a couple of areas that are surrounded by bone. That would be the bony labyrinth. Then we have this area in the middle that's surrounded by only membrane, and that's the, the membranous labyrinth. And the other big thing about this is the fluid actually differs between the bony and membranous labyrinth. Within the bony labyrinth, we have um, fluid called perilymph. Within the membranous labyrinth, we call it endolymph. So they, they are two distinct fluids. All right, so we're going to start kind of in the middle here, and we're going to talk about um, how this area can be used for equilibrium. So actually, before we even do that, we're just going to do some more, some basic anatomy here. So. Let's start here in the middle. Uh, the vestibule is used for equilibrium, but this whole area is called the vestibule. There's two distinct areas, a utricle and a saccule. I'm not going to ask you that. I usually just want you to know that this is the vestibule here. But inside it, it's important to understand that there's a membrane called the macula. So there's a membrane, like a layer of tissue, uh, inside the vestibule called the macula. On that membrane, you have these little hair cells. 
the hair cells um, have little, almost like cilia coming off of them. So you have a lot of what they call stereocilia, and then one big cilia called the kinocilium. So let me show you what that looks like really quick, and then we'll come back to it. So this is a hair cell, and you can see that coming off of that hair cell, you have this one kind of big primary cilium called the kinocilium. Then all these other ones are just called stereocilia. And so all of these hair cells together would make up that membrane called the macula. So that's what I'm getting at here. So that's all throughout the vestibule. All right, and then the other parts, which we'll come back to again, just to introduce them really quick. These are called the semicircular canals, and then this is called the cochlea, and we'll come back to that. So uh, vestibule, long story short, vestibule and the semicircular canals are used in equilibrium. The cochlea is used in hearing. So let's talk about equilibrium. So if we focus on the vestibule, like we said earlier, uh, there's a membrane inside the vestibule called the macula. It's loaded with these hair cells. So within the vestibule, you have this the layer of macula. On top of it, not only do you have the hair cells, but you have this gelatinous layer, kind of like jello. And it has a bunch of little calcium crystals in it. So it's just envision like a layer of jello on top of these hair cells. And it's got like little calcium crystals in it, and they're called otoliths. So otoliths, the little calcium crystals. And so what's going to happen here, and you can see the hair cells are uh, connected to neurons. So this vest, the vestibule and the macula is responsible for de us to detect forward and back backward accelerations or movements. So in other words, if you were sitting in a car and you took off and you, you would realize you were moving, that's a forward acceleration. Uh, and we generally call that static equilibrium, even though you may be moving. All right, so this is what would happen, let's say, if you tilted your head down. So here's the macula with the uh, gelatinous layer on top of it, and I guess we should give that a name. The gelatinous layer is called the otolithic membrane or statoconic membrane. That's the gelatinous layer, that's its name. And so if you tilted your head forward, that gelatinous layer would slide a little bit. And what that's gonna do is bend the hair cells. It's going to bend the, the kinocilium and stereocilia on the hair cells. That's going to stimulate those hair cells to generate action potentials, which are going to go to the brain to tell your brain that we're moving or our head's being tilted down or whatever the case may be. And that's basically how the vestibule works. So to recap really quickly, you got a layer of hair cells called the macula. On top of it, you have the statoconic membrane, which is like the gelatinous layer spilled with these little things called otoliths and so any movement of that uh, membrane will bend the cilia stereocilia kinocilia on the hair cells and generate action potential so your brain can understand what's going on uh, as far as these semicircular canals um, they're responsible for us detecting rotational movements and we call this dynamic equilibrium so if you look, there's three semicircular canals, and they're strategically placed. So one's uh, at, in one plane, the next one's at a completely different plane, and one's in the middle. So it lets us detect rotation in all these different planes. So at the base of each semicircular canal, you have this expanded region called the ampulla. And then within the ampulla, which is this region right here, so this is an ampulla. And then within, if you look inside that, you have this big bump called the crista ampullaris. It's lined with the same hair cells that we talked about earlier. So each hair cell has stereocilia and one kinocilium. And then on top of the hair cells, and this time you don't get a full membrane, you just get a glob of gel gelatinous material. And the, the glob is called the cupula. So the cupula is this big glob sitting on top of these hair cells. And remember that's in each of these ampulla regions. So there's one for each semicircular canals. So what's going to happen is this. If you rotate your head, look what's going to happen to the gelatinous material, the cupula. It's going to kind of lag behind the hair cells and again causing them to bend, generating action potentials going to the brain, telling your brain that you're moving in a certain direction. 
So to recap, the semicircular canals detect rotational type movements based on how we just described them. And so the vestibular pathway, which is involved in equilibrium, is the vestibular branch of cranial nerve number eight, which is the vestibulocochlear nerve, which you've learned before. Okay, the other thing about the ear is the hearing aspect of it. So um, there's a lot going on here, but to be honest, there's like a really good picture that I'm going to show you that kind of explains the whole process. So I'll go through some of this, do some anatomy, and then we'll talk about the whole process. So if we look at the inner ear again, this is what we're focused on right here, the cochlea. Uh, the cochlea, if we took a section of it, it would look like this. So you, it's kind of like a big windy road, like the yellow brick road. Um, if you cut into it, it look like this. So one of these units is called a modiolus, and there's three regions. And so if you remember from our discussion er earlier, here and here, this is the bony labyrinth containing the perilymph. This area here is the um, membranous labyrinth containing the endolymph. All right, so, however, in the cochlea, we actually give these regions names. So, scala media is the one in the middle, sometimes called the cochlear duct. I, we, I commonly call it scala media. On top of it, scala vestibuli, and on the bottom, scala tympani. All right, so, scala media in the middle, scala vestibuli on the top, scala tympani on the bottom. If you look for, at any of these, it's exactly the same. And it doesn't matter which way you're looking at it. The scale of tympani is always on the bottom. The scale of vestibuli is always on the top. Scale of media is always in the middle. All right. Uh, last thing on this slide. Well, a couple more things, actually. Uh, there's two membranes associated with that, that, this, that separates the tympani from the media and the media from the vestibuli. So this one's easy. It's called the vestibular membrane. Just think it's the vestibular membrane is between the scala media and scala vestibuli. And then this one is called the basilar membrane. Just think it's on the base, it's on the bottom. So basilar membrane, vestibular membrane. Last thing, if we kind of follow this little curly cue all the way to the end right there, that tip is called the helico trema. Not a major deal, but that's what that word means. It's talking about the point right there, helico trema. All right, so zooming in on one of these areas. So there's what, this is what we just discussed, scala vestibuli, scala tympani, scala media. This is the scala, uh, I'm sorry, vestibular membrane, basilar membrane. Well, on the basilar membrane, we have the apparatus that allows us to hear. It's called the organ of cordy, sometimes called the spiral organ because it spirals all throughout the cochlea. So the organ of cordy, consists of, the, has this spiral, I'm sorry, this, um, the basilar membrane has the organ of cordy. The organ of cordy has these little hair cells, very similar to what we talked about earlier. And so each hair cell is going to have its kinocilium, stereocilia. And this time there's another kind of gelatinous like layer on top. This time it's called a tectorial membrane. And so the concept's similar. You got hair cells, and you got this layer on top called the tectorial membrane. And remember, that's all right here on the basilar membrane. So what's going to happen is something's going to cause this basilar membrane to start moving. The tectorial membrane is going to move the, the cilia on the hair cells, and you're going to get action potentials sent to the brain. So what causes that? There's a lot of text here, so I'm going to jump to the picture that I like to use to describe this. So if you can envision sound coming in through the ear here, it's going to hit the eardrum or tympanic membrane. It's going to start vibrating. That's going to move the malleus, the incus, and then the stapes. So the stapes, remember, was embedded into this little opening called the oval window. Well, the oval window opens up to the beginning of the scala vestibuli that we just talked about. So the movement here is going to cause pressure waves in the perilymph of the scala vestibuli 
and they're going to go down a certain place all through the cochlea. And at some point, those pressure waves are going to cross over the scale of media. And when they do that, it's going to move the organ of cordae, the hair cells are going to move in the tectorial me membrane, and that's going to cause the action potentials to be sent to the brain to tell you that you heard something. The pressure waves don't end, though. They keep going. They're going to go in, into the scale of tympani and then start heading out. And they're actually going to exit into the middle ear at an opening called the round window. So let me just recap that really quick. So you got the, press, the, the sound waves moving the auditory ossicles, moves the stapes in the oval window, causes pressure waves in the uh, perilymp of the scala vestibuli. At some point, in this picture right here, the pressure waves are going to cross over to the endolymph of the um, scala media, move the organ of cordae, cause the hair cells to send action potentials. The pressure waves are going to enter the scala tympani and exit at the round window. That's pretty much it. Um, so there's a few other things to talk about, but I'm just going to go back and take you through the text and make sure it makes sense. So the sound waves come in, they're funneled by the auricle of the ear, enter the ear canal, go through the tympanic membrane. Vibration of the tympanic membrane causes the auditory ossicles to move, the stapes moves in the oval window, transmits sounds to pressure waves. The, um, the pressure causes the vestibular membrane to vibrate, and then you get end up getting pressure waves in the endolymph of the scala media. The basilar membrane moves, the organ of cordy moves, I should say. Hair cells send nervous impulses. Remaining pressure waves go to the perilymph of the scala tympani and exit at the round window. And this is why I said that picture is great, because it, it lets you visualize all of this text. All right, so a couple other things. How do we d determine what sounds we hear? So sound waves are classified by frequency and intensity. Intensity is just how loud it is. It's measured in units called decibels. So that has to do with the size of the sound waves. But more interestingly, the frequency also is important. So if you look at these different sound waves, uh, you c it's really kind of it's kind of hard to tell from the picture. But uh, a high frequency sound, the waves would be really close together, even though it doesn't look like it here. Low frequency, the waves would be further apart. But nevertheless, if you, you look, compare a low frequency sound versus a high frequency sound, the low frequency sounds go further down the scale of vestibuli before they cross over. High frequency sounds cross over really quick. So that, depending on what hair cells are actually stimulated, that allows us to in to interpret sounds differently by the frequency. Um, if you think about it like this, it's possible that, like in this case, it looks like the sound frequency or the frequency is so low that we, we're not even going to hear it because it goes all the way in without even crossing over. And the same thing is true about a very high frequency sound. It won't ever make it down far enough to disrupt your hair cells and the organ of cordy. So we can only hear sounds within a certain frequency range. You've probably heard that some animals are different than us and they can hear things at a higher frequency, and that's true. Like dogs and cats can hear at a lot higher frequency because their inner ear is a little bit different. All right, auditory pathway, basically uh, cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. That's really all you need to, to know. Okay, last thing, last special sense, olfaction or smell. Relatively simple. So you have in your nasal cavity... Uh, you have these little neuron endings hanging down through the cribriform plate. And they're coming off the olfactory tract or bulb, which is cranial nerve number one. And so you get these olfactory neurons, which are basically bipolar neurons. They hang through the cribriform plate. And at the ends of each, you can see there's little olfactory hairs. And that is what actually detects odor molecules. So when Odor molecules go in through the nose, they enter the nasal cavity. Your little bipolar neurons here are going to be stimulated. That's going to stimulate these. And then action potentials are going to be sent towards the olfactory um, tract and then towards the brain to let your brain know that you smelled something. So a couple other things. This is basically it. Uh, just a bigger picture. Odor molecules come in, the olfactory hairs detect it, stimulates these bipolar neurons, sends action potentials via the olfactory tract towards the brain.